Hi everyone, welcome to the 100 Respect webinar series. Today's topic is For Love or Money, Understanding Financial Abuse. 100 Respect is pleased to welcome Tony Bentley. Tony is a health promotion worker at Women's Health in the North, Melbourne. Her work centers on economic participation for women and the development of community education resources to end violence against women. Tony led the development of the successful social marketing campaign Love Control that sought to increase young women's understanding of the early warning signs of intimate partner violence. More recently, she has combined her expertise in resource development along with um, addressing women's financial capability Capa oh, sorry, capabilities to produce for Love or Money. For Love or Money is a film and educational package that aims to increase women's access to messages about identifying and understanding financial abuse and the impact it has on their lives. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posting questions to the presenter. Your questions can be typed into the chat box, which is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Responses to your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to pass you over to Tony to begin. Yep, ready to go. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Okay, so um, before I get started on talking about, about financial abuse, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of what I'll be discussing today in relation to it. So, um, to move down to the first slide. Is that coming out? Yeah. Okay, so this is the agenda um, for today's session. Um, firstly, I'll be talking about um, what financial abuse is and work through some definitions of it. And we know that this financial abuse is not an easy form of abuse to identify and define, so I'll spend some time unpacking it. Then we'll look briefly at the legislation in relation to it. And finally, I'll provide some facts and figures on financial abuse. Then I'll move on to, just after that, um, providing a snapshot of the different forms of tactics that perpetrators use in terms of financial abuse. Then I'll look at the way financial abuse intersects with other forms of domestic violence. And um, I'll use the economic abuse wheel to explain that a bit. Then I'll move on to painting a picture of what financial abuse looks like. Then I'll explain the social and gendered landscape that underpins financial abuse. So we'll look at the social context in which um, the conditions occur, the conditions for it occur. Then I'll look at the impact financial abuse has on women and children. And finally, I'll provide you with a list of resources and tools that will facilitate a bit of discussion and understanding on financial abuse. Okay, so just moving on, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Women's Health in the North, and Women's Health in the North is a regional women's health promotion organisation, and we're based in the northern metropolitan region of Melbourne. We focus, um, most of our work tends to focus on the prevention side of health rather than direct service, although in saying that, we do deliver community education and training on financial literacy, um, financial capability, sexual and reproductive health, and identifying and responding to family violence. So as you can see, we've currently got a number of strategic priority areas, including gender equity, preventing violence against women, sexual and reproductive health, economic participation, and environmental justice. Okay. Right. Okay, so unpacking financial abuse. Well, recently, we've been hearing a lot more about financial abuse. Now, a lot of this is because of the increasingly high incidence of financial abuse within the context of elder abuse. Now, before I move on into a discussion about financial abuse, I just want to premise it by saying that I won't be focusing on elder abuse today or financial abuse in relation um, to the elderly. I'll be focusing on financial abuse specifically in relation to violence against women. So talking, so in the context of intimate partner violence. 
Um, yeah, so that means we'll be taking more of a gendered lens approach to it. Okay, so just before we move into definitions, there's something else I'd like to clarify. Often you might hear of economic abuse or financial abuse. Now, often they just use interchangeably within the literature and in practice. So for the most part within today's session, I'll just refer to financial abuse. Okay, so what do we mean by financial abuse? Well, we know that financial abuse is the least recognised and understood form of violence against women. We know that it's usually connected to other forms of family and intimate partner violence and that it's the biggest cause of homelessness for women in Australia. Financial abuse is complex and it's played out in many different complex ways. So financial abuse can include something like denying women access to money, sabotaging women's employment opportunities and secretly maintaining their assets while forcing or coercing their partner to draw upon their own financial resources. Now in terms of a sort of adequate definition of financial abuse, the best definition um, that I was able to source or that I know of comes from a research report by Good Shepherd and Kildonan and Uniting Care. And that research report is titled Economic Abuse Searching for Solutions. Now in that report they define it as specifically as a form of domestic family violence that negatively affects a person financially and undermines their efforts to become economically independent. So like other forms of family violence, financial abuse is a gendered issue where women are the primary victims and men are the key perpetrators. So we can see that it is a gendered issue and that it involves specifically behaviours that control a woman's ability to acquire, use and maintain economic resources that thereby threaten her economic insecurity and her potential for self-sufficiency. So I hope that that definition makes things a little clearer. Um, I'll just talk now about the legislation around financial abuse because it's only recently been recognised in the Australian Family Law Act of 1975 and that's only for some states so there are only some jurisdictions that include economic or financial abuse within their definition of family violence and those states are Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. So in terms of legal definition and requirements, we know that there are different, some differences in the precise formulations of economic abuse within those jurisdictions and that may include, for example, um, unreasonable controlling behaviour without consent that denies a person their financial autonomy, uh, withholding financial support reasonably necessary for the maintenance of a partner coercing a partner to relinquish control over their assets, unreasonably preventing a person from taking part in decisions over the household expenditure or the disposition of joint property, uh, coercing the person to claim social security payments and finally preventing the person from seeking or keeping employment. So it's only the Tasmanian um, provision that actually criminalises economic abuse and we know that to date that so far no one's been um, prosecuted under that legislation just because it's, it's so difficult to identify. So we know that um, financial abuse is a particular form of violence that's been identified as being highly prevalent against older women, um, particularly in relation to elder abuse, but I won't go into to detail today in that. Um, and we know that it's vastly underreported. So that makes it really difficult in terms of um, getting you know, accurate measures of it. So to date there's no actual statistics on financial abuse but we do know that it's prevalent and a common feature of domestic violence. Okay, so we know the evidence shows us that it's likely to have occurred in approximately 50% of abusive relationships. 
So if we use that estimate of it occurring in 50% of abusive relationships, we can estimate that 1.86 million women in Australia have experienced it. So it's quite, quite a significant number. And we've drawn that measure. So that measure comes from the fact that we know that one in three women have experienced domestic violence at some point in their lifetime. So, I mean, that's just an estimate, but because um, we don't have any accurate measure to go on, but it's, um, yeah, probably close to being, yeah, um, the most real measure we've got. Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, just bear with me a moment. Um, okay, yeah. So, now I'll be talking at the types of perpetrators or the types of tactics that perpetrators use. Now I've got on the screen um, a topology of different types of perpetrators, but I'm not going to go into that today. I'm just going to look more closely at the type of tactics that they use in terms of financial abuse. And Typically, it's the types of tactics that are used similarly in other forms of um, family or domestic violence. Okay, so um, so the first one that appears on the screen is the use of power, control, and fear around not only around finances but around all aspects of a woman's life. So, um, but if we break it down in terms of financial abuse. We, some examples might be, you know, that the perpetrator, perpetrators were or are really secretive or lie about their own finances, yet are insistent on controlling the women's money and using her financial resources rather than his. Um, and generally, so generally that's asserted through and achieved through assert, the perpetrator asserting their own power and control by lying about a lot of financial matters. And that's sort of um, later on when you get a chance to hopefully look at the film for Love or Money, you'll see how that's played out within the context of an abusive relationship. So they might use, you know, typical um, assertions of anger or threats of physical abuse if the woman questions them about the, their financial situation. And a lot of the time, you know, women are left to carry the burden, the economic burden of the relationship. So it kind of feeds into a whole type of feminization of poverty within the relationship for the woman. And I'll just say this quote, this quote came from a woman we interviewed when we were um, making the film for Love or Money. And she said, you know, he was earning a lot, even though he earned $50,000 a year more than me, I was the one paying for all the bills and we never seemed to have any money. Although thinking back, he did have money. He had money for a new car, a trip away with his mates, nights out. So you can see how, you know, um, within that relationship, he was coercing her into using all of her. She worked in, she had a professional job. He was coercing her into using her money and her economic resources within the relationship while keeping his completely hidden and separate and depriving her financially. Okay, so the second tactic I've got there is the use of surveillance, which is a common tactic that's used um, within domestic violence situations. So he might, for example, uh, use the server use surveillance around her expenditure, and that's a common feature of financial abuse. Um, and lots of women we interviewed reported having, you know, having been required to account for every single little cent of money they spend and they were forced to show receipts to purchase goods and then belittled for being wasteful or hopeless with money. Now that was a really common experience for women and they were often insisted by their partners, the perpetrators, that they always that their partners always attend shopping trips with them just to monitor their you know, monitor their spending and to try and control every item that they purchased, even if it was for necessities like sanitary um, napkins or, you know, basic food um, for, for children. Now the third, um, third tactic I have there is gaslighting. Um, now gaslighting is a really powerful and effective form of 
um, tactic that's used in violence, in intimate partner violence. So this specific tactic, gaslighting, is um, done in a way that's used to confuse and erode a woman's self-confidence and to trust and her ability to trust her own, you know, capability around managing money. So we, we know that it's a really powerful strategy. It's inflicted on a person leave, that leads them to question their own um, perception of reality. So when used in the context of financial abuse, we know that it's highly effective in gaining access and control over a person's financial resources. Okay, so I'll just move on to um, bringing up the economic abuse wheel. No, and have a look at, so I use this, um, I'm not sure if many of you have seen the um, abuse wheel before, it comes in different versions, but this one focuses specifically on how forms and tactics of violence are used to manipulate and control a woman's access to finances. Okay, so as we can see from the economic abuse wheel, um, economic abuse reinforces reinforces and overlaps with other types of control. Um, it so it provides an additional tool, tool through which to perpetrate other forms of violence. Now the economic abuse wheel was developed on the basis of you know a lot of research, uh, research to, to illustrate that. So and I'll move, I'll just move along shortly and show you, demonstrate ways in which it interacts with other forms of violence and it's played out in day-to-day -day situations um, with women. Okay, so I'll just give you a second just to have a, a look, a bit more of a closer look at that economic abuse wheel. Okay, so we can see, yeah, so, you know, various tactics like using coercion and threats, um, you know, trying to intimidate the woman, using emotional abuse tactics like gaslighting, isolating her, minimising, denying and blaming her for their um, financial situation, using the children to as a way to manipulate um, their financial situation, using male privilege and using um, straight out economic abuse. So I'll go into detail with that just in a moment. Okay, so um, based on what I've just said, I'll just take a little bit of time just to really nut out what financial abuse looks like, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in women's lives. Um, we know that it's really subtle it usually appears very early on in a relationship and often it can be things like, you know, when a partner, uh, when a couple have first got together and they're talking about moving in with one another, there can be real insistence by a partner that he moves in with her, for example, and thereby, you know, drawing a pile of her economic resources. He can also insist that, you know, they have joint bank accounts. And often that's kind of framed, you know, within, you know, the language of love and trust and, you know, that that's something that would signify a commitment to the relationship by having joint accounts. So some partners also insist on taking over, it gets played out in different ways. So some partners might insist on taking um, complete responsibility of or control of the household finances. So frame it in a way that, you know, he's more of an expert on financial management and she can be left, you know, not to worry, have, having to worry about that side of things. So agreeing to join accounts and um, relinquishing control are usually manifest early on in the relationship. Okay, so we'll look at just how um, control over day-to-day -day household finance material well-being um, is played out. So this can come out in many different ways and it might be, you know, you might see examples in with some of your clients where a woman is denied access to any of her money, any money of her own and to the family's money or to bank accounts. That's a common one. So she's completely denied of any access to any money and completely relying on him. 
Um, he could also make her ask or beg for money. He could also um, set uh, set up an inadequate figure to manage household costs. So, for example, giving her a budget of twenty dollars a week to do all the grocery shopping, and and, get, and actually giving her that money and forcing her to feed the family on that. He could actually, you know, start stealing from her if she does have any economic resources herself. He could also deny her access to any of their financial situation, information about their financial situation. So, you know, cover his tracks with um, hiding receipts or burning receipts, you know, making excuses to her for, you know, reasons not to look at the, the bank, you know, the monthly bank statements. And he can also just make the woman feel financially dependent and una unable to meet her basic needs. Um, now he could also subject her to food insecurity, so that goes back to giving her just a certain small amount of money each week to live off that's not enough. So often the woman and children can go um, without getting their basic needs around food net. So another way in which financial abuse can be played out involves denying the accumulation of personal assets or eroding those assets. So examples of this might, you might see might include things like, you know, exerting power and control over her, over a woman's salary if she's still allowed to work, um, exerting power and control over her savings, debt, credit and employment through threats and, you know, physical abuse or emotional abuse. Or he might just, you know, outright bleed the woman's personal resources dry during the relationship. He might use their joint funds to gamble and keep that gambling problem um, secret and hidden. Or he might uh, physically, you know, destroy the woman's possessions in fits of rage and abuse. So the third, the third um, one I've got up there uh, is manipulating credit and debt to the abused partners or to the survivor's disadvantage. So for example, he... So making the woman financially responsible for all the debt. So putting, keeping, setting up bills in her name and then leaving and she's got, you know, quite a significant debt accrued. Building up debt and affecting, and that will, you know, play out in terms of affecting her credit rating. He may keep utilities or loans just registered in her name for the duration of the relationship and, um, and then hide the accrual of debt over time. Um, then he may he may face he may even uh, make the women ba woman bankrupt um, for his debts his accrual of debts. So another way in which um, financial abuse can manifest is by blocking access to all social and economic her social and economic participation. So he might outrightly sabotage her her education and employment through a number of tactics. He may not allow, even allow her to work or undertake education. He might deny her access, you know, to means, um, to transportation, to getting to work, and just basically employing a whole range of um, sabotage tactics so she can't work, and is therefore more reliant on him. So another way it gets played out is uh, by financially monitoring over controlling and scrutinizing the woman and I touched on this before around the surveillance side of things. So he'll just do that like by exerting complete financial control even after the woman's left. So, you know, by de denying um, child payment access um, and continually taking her through the courts um, legally so she's left even more financially disadvantaged. So another way it can get uh, played out is by refusing to make any contribution, any financial contribution during the relationship. And this is a fairly exploitative technique. So it's not so whereby he's not accountable to his own spending. You know, he's always he always doesn't have enough money when they go out, um, and she has to use her money. He refuses, to, or he might refuse to work or claim benefits, and therefore you know has a high level of economic dependence on her. So you can see how that's quite different to some of the other ways it manifests. Or he might, you know, outrightly refuse to pay bills or refuse to contribute to any financial cost to the rearing of children. 
Okay, so he might even generate economic um, costs within the context of the relationships by storing clothes or property. And finally, he may even in extreme situations use the woman, exploit the, wo the woman sexually in exchange for money. Now, how are we going for time? Okay, so I'll just, we're getting short on time, so I'll just touch on this a little bit in terms of the social landscape by looking at the, the social landscape in which financial abuse does occur. So I've already noted that the exercise of power and control and sustained fear is the key factor in financial abuse. However, the way it manifests on a cultural level uh, relates to a number of things. So probably the main one would be gender inequality, so the unequal power relations between men and women. And part of this is we know that men actually get paid a lot more than women. I think the gender pay gap is still sitting at about 18.8%. So his earning capacity is a lot more than hers and um, this makes her a bit more vulnerable to being financially disadvantaged within a relationship. Gender stereotypes, now this is a really interesting and powerful one that's used within the context of abuse and financial abuse. So it relies on that we, you know, a lot of men still see themselves as breadwinners and there's the, those terrible narratives out there that position women as, you know, just being bad with money. Women are bad, terrible managers of money. They're not financially capable. You know, it's something, a job that's better left to a man to do. You know, or even that women, women waste money on trivial items like going shopping for shoes. Now, they're very powerful cultural stereotypes that still function and, ser and serve a really powerful role within financial abuse. Now, the another one that's really powerful too is the structured inequities. So, um, I touched on that a little bit around um, the way financial abuse continues to be perpetuated once a relationship's been is over. So, for many women, they don't have the financial means once the relationship's over to pursue their legal requirements and contest property settlements. Uh, why a a, an organisation based in Melbourne have conducted some really interesting research on that and yeah, I'd encourage everyone to, to take a look at that. I won't go into it here. And I think another really powerful um, narrative in terms of all of this functioning is, you know, what, what we still see is the private nature of money and family violence within our society. Often we don't want to talk about money or if we have money problems. Um, so a lot of women feel a deep sense of shame and won't talk about some of the abuse that's happening because of that. So it creates like almost like a double layer of shame and secrecy around the violence that's being perpetuated. And finally, there's just a, a, a lack of awareness about financial abuse. It's still greatly misunderstood. It's still really hard to identify because it gets played out in so many different ways, in many different complicated ways. So it's still just coming to the surface in terms of our awareness of it. Okay, so I'll just move on to look at some of the impact that financial abuse does have on um, women and children. So we know that it has really serious impacts on women's economic, physical and psychological health. Now a major consequence is that the survivor becomes financially dependent on the perpetrator. So it makes it even more, doubly even more difficult for a woman to leave an abusive relationship. So for a woman in this situation, leaving an abusive relationship means having to face the face an uncertain economic future, even one that's, um, you know, even one of homelessness and entrenched poverty. And as I said earlier on in the presentation, we know that it's one of the leading factors of homelessness for women. So the lack of economic resources that financial abuse creates also fosters a high level of economic dependence and a woman's short and long-term economic and possibly psychological health are drastically affected. So on top of this, many, many women may have been out of the workforce for a long time because of the raising a family or the demands from the abusive partner 
or demands from the abusive partner that they actually stop working. Now this then impacts on their ability to actually re-enter the workforce later down the track um, and further entrenches them into a cycle of poverty. Okay, so um, we know that there's also, as with other types of uh, domestic violence, then there are poor mental health outcomes such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder, and the long uh, long-term impacts of the stress on physical health, you know, really impact on the immune system and can be a risk factor in terms of autoimmune disorder, diabetes and heart disease. Now we're getting uh, close to wrapping it up but before, before I do I just want to uh, just touch on a number of, there's some really excellent resources and tools that are out there that will help to enable your work around this. So the first one I know Money Smart for many of you who don't know is a nationwide uh, financial capability website that's set up by ATSIC and they're in the process at the moment of developing a whole section around um, relationships and money and financial abuse. So that's a really good one to check out. Another one is the Financial and Consumer Rights Council. Now they um, don't themselves provide financial counselling or advice but they have an Australia wide map that provides details of financial counsellors in all states. So if you know, if you recognise one of your clients having um, experienced financial abuse, this is a really good website to refer them to. Now another one is that we developed it here at Women's Health in the North and that's For Love or Money and that's a film, that's a seven minute film and it's done, um, portrayed um, narrative based style based on a woman's experience of financial abuse and that, that's just a very sort of clear kind of um, film that will help you to unpack what it, what it might look like. You can act, there's a link there that um, yeah, that shows you where you can access that film. Another um, organ, women's organisation, Women's Health Goulburn North East, they've developed a series of six postcards and they're called Keeping Your Boat Afloat and they detail um, different types of young women's experience of financial abuse and they're really good to use with groups within, with clients within a group context and get discussion generated about financial abuse. And finally I mentioned before that their Good Shepherd Youth and Family Service and Kilzona and United Care have done a lot of work in this area. So they've got a, a research report that's entitled Economic Abuse, Searching for Solutions and WIRE also have a number of uh, research reports on financial abuse and they're in the process at the moment of conducting focus groups around that. So you can get on their website and if you've got clients who are in Victoria and who might be interested in participating, you can refer them. There's a whole lot of information there. Okay, so and I'll just conclude by I've listed all the references that um, I have, you know, made reference to in today's presentation. So there's some further references for you to to look at and yeah, follow up if you want to increase your knowledge about financial abuse. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks Tony for the informative presentation. I think we all now have a very good understanding of financial abuse. Before we move into question time, we would like to let you know about an app that 100 Respect has recently released. The app called DAISY connects women experiencing gendered violence to state and local service including specialist services, housing and legal services. You can also use DAISY to find the right services for your clients. You'll find, sorry, you'll find the link to DAISY in the chat box. And also in the chat box you can see the link to download the certificate of attendance for today's webinar. Okay, we're now going to open up for a few questions for Tony to answer. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing the questions into the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Please note that 
um, case-specific information cannot be answered during the webinar. We have had a few questions come through. Um, the, first qu the first question um, is from Mary. And she's asking, I've seen your video for Love and Money. Can you talk a little about how you made it and how you think workers might use it? Yeah, sure. OK, so um, we completed for Love and Money at the end of last year. And we used a um, kind of social marketing approach to making that film. So we interviewed a number of women who had experienced financial abuse. And we, you know, took took their stories and then used the kind of key messages that came out of all of those stories, and there were common patterns, of course. And then we embedded the key messages that we wanted to to get across within the narrative of the film. So we wrote the the film is like just a short drama, but we made sure we got clear messages embedded into the, the dialogue of that film. And then what we did was we tested that against um, with another focus group of young women just to make sure that those messages were clear and that the story you know, would be relevant to a whole range of women. So um, that's how we kind of developed it. And in terms of using the film, we at the, we see it as uh, something that financial well that a whole range of workers can use with their clients. So we know that financial counselors have been using it um, within with some of their clients to get them to try and understand, you know, what financial abuse is. We know that social workers have been using it um, within their groups. So it's use, it, it would be really great to use within a group context with women who, who may be coming to that family violence programs. Um, yeah, or anyone, or if you have a client who, you know, you suspect might be in that situation, you might want to refer them to the film as well and to see if that resonates with aspects of their experience. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, we've had another question coming through. Um, yeah. What sort of things can financial counsellors help with? Sure. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, financial counsellors can, I guess, really uh, help once, I mean, it's unfortunate, but once there has been um, prop, like if financial abuse has been perpetrated and there's been a level of debt accumulated. So financial counsellors can be really effective in terms of working with, um, you know, utility hardship um, groups so that they can manage the credit or even like help some uh, women lower their debt or come to some sort of payment plan. They can, they can be really good at just managing the level of debt and working through that with a woman and coming up with a plan and also to advocating on her behalf to different companies um, with whom the, the debt may have been accrued with. She also may, um, the financial council may spend some time with a woman, you know, working around budgetary stuff um, and sort of basic financial literacy. Yeah, but the, the main thing a financial counsellor would do would be to work on lessening or lowering those debts for a woman. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Um, what sort of question might start a conversation about financial abuse with a client? Yeah. So um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. The if you I, when I was going through the resources and tools, the cards that um, Women's Health Global North East developed. They're just really simple, visual with a quote on them. They, they can be a really effective means to open up discussion about financial abuse. And we've done that with groups of young women. And it kind of tests their, you know, tests their knowledge to around, you know, what they see, what might be, um, you know, financial abuse or, you know, something that's just a bit more exploitative. So it really kind of, because it can be murky area. So those cards are really good for, for helping someone identify whether a situation is, you know, financially abusive or not. So I'd probably start with those cards from Women's Golden, uh, Women's Health Golden North East. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. 
Well, it looks like we're just about out of time. Thank you, Tony, for answering all those questions, and thank you very uh, much, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Our next webinar is on Thursday, 30, 30th of April, and the topic is Improving Cross-Cultural Practice Strategies and Resources for Working with Women from Cold Backgrounds. If you'd like a certificate of attendance for participating in the webinar, you can download the certificate from the chat box. On behalf of the entire 100 Respect team, thank you for attending this webinar and we hope that you have found it valuable. Please stay online now to take our quick survey. Thank you.